Today, why Frodo Baggins is a joke, a city of pigs, and an army of philosophical dogs. I'm Cliff Mark, and this is Good in Theory. What do you do when you meet someone with terrible opinions, who wants to share them with you, but has no interest in listening to anyone else's ideas except to shoot them down? We've all been in this situation, and last episode, so was Socrates. He was having a nice conversation about justice with Polemarchus, and Thrasymachus jumps up and starts yelling at him. Thrasymachus is a professional sophist, and he's a nihilist, and he gave this big show-offy speech about how justice and morality are just a lie, and that how any smart person would do as much crime and bullying and theft as they could get away with. Thrasymachus was intentionally defending the counterintuitive jerk position. He didn't want to listen or learn. He only wanted to crush Socrates in public and show everyone that he's the smartest in the room. So how do you deal with this kind of asshole? Socrates is not going to just walk away. Debating about justice is his thing. But he also knows he's not going to be able to persuade Thrasymachus, so he settles on humiliating him. He asks Thrasymachus a million leading questions, and then makes him contradict himself, and when he does, he rubs it in until Thrasymachus just gives up the conversation and goes to sulk. If you can't talk to them, own them. But today, Socrates is facing an entirely different kind of conversational challenge. Assholes are not the only people in the world with bad opinions. So how do you deal with good people, or people who at least you have some hope for them, who have bad ideas, or who are considering bad ideas. You know people like this. And if you don't, you're going to meet two today. When Thrasymachus gives up, two young men named Glaucon and Adamantus take over the conversation. Glaucon is the guy that Socrates was hanging out with originally. They went to the festival in Piraeus together, where they ran into Polemarchus, who invited them to the gathering that they're now at. Adamantus is Glaucon's older brother, and he was with Polemarchus when they all ran into each other. Socrates already knows both of these guys. He knows their family, so he has a relationship with them. He wants the best for them. And, fun fact, Adamantus and Glaucon are Plato's real-life older brothers. And I just think this is so cute that the most famous book in Western philosophy is a fantasy conversation that the baby of the family wrote about his big brothers and his teacher. Anyway, Glaucon and Adamantus are basically decent boys. Or at least, we hope at this point that they'll turn out that way. But, they've been listening to people like Thrasymachus, and Thrasymachus kind of makes sense to them. They're coming of age, they're still figuring out who they want to be, they're from the ruling class of Athens, so they're rich and posh as they come, and they're going to have a lot of of opportunity to get away with things, especially on the path that's laid out for them. Posh boys are supposed to amass wealth and power, to win glory, to live the good life, and generally be big shots in Athens. That's what success looks like for people in their class. That's what they're supposed to want. And because they've lived in elite circles, they'll have looked around and noticed that the people who really succeed in Athens don't always do it by completely virtuous means. And this poses a bit of a dilemma for them. Glaucon and Adamantus, they want to think of themselves as good people, but they're also probably wondering whether being too fussy about their morals might interfere with their other ambitions. Thrasymachus, he's just articulated a very strong position for going to the dark side. And Socrates replied with just a bunch of logical and rhetorical tricks. The boys are not satisfied. So they are going to defend the same anti-justice position that Thrasymachus did, and they're going to challenge Socrates to defeat it properly, to really give them a compelling case for justice. But even though they're taking up a position opposing Socrates, they're coming in with a totally different attitude. Whereas Thrasymachus came to win, 
the brothers actually seem to want to learn something. And that makes all the difference to how the conversation goes. It only took Socrates half a chapter to own Thrasymachus, but he sees that he might actually get somewhere with Glaucon and Adamantus, that he might be able to persuade these young men to actually start thinking seriously about justice. So he takes a totally different approach, and that's why his conversation with the brothers lasts for the entire rest of the Republic. We're going to pick up the story right after Thrasymachus gave up. At this point, Glaucon jumps in and he starts pushing Socrates for more answers. In the dialogue, Zach Amsleg is going to play Glaucon, and his real-life sister, Rebecca Amsleg, is going to play Adamantus. Socrates, are you really trying to convince us that we should be just rather than unjust? Yes, that's exactly what I'd like to do. Well, you're not doing it. Just to clarify, are you saying that justice is good in itself, like good health, or only for its consequences, like exercising at the gym or working for money? Both. I think that justice is good for the consequences that it brings, but I also think that justice is good in itself. Well, that's where most people would say you're wrong. I think Thrasymachus gave up too early. Do you mind if I try defending his position again for the sake of argument? Not, not because I believe it, obviously, but I want to hear you refute it properly. You want to keep talking about justice all night, Glaucon? You're a man after my own heart. <laughs> okay, Socrates. Well, here it is. Nobody chooses justice for itself. If anyone had their way, they'd go around taking whatever they want and doing whatever they want to whoever they want. It's just human nature. We like doing injustice. The problem is that we really hate it when other people do it to us. And that's why we invented laws and rules and agreements. Everyone gives up the freedom to screw over others to avoid being screwed over themselves. But this is just a second best compromise. It's not like people love following the rules. They only do it because they're afraid of the consequences of breaking them. And if you want proof, imagine what happens when you give someone the power to do whatever they want without any consequences. Think of the legend of Guy Jesus' ring. In that story, a shepherd finds the ring of invisibility. And the minute he understands his power, he goes to the capital, beds the queen, kills the king, and takes over the city. Uh, and the point of the story isn't that the shepherd is evil. The story is about what anyone would do if they knew they could get away with it. If you take a man who has never broken a rule in his life and you give him unlimited power, he'll act the exact same way as an unjust man. And if someone did have a magic ring and never used it for their own advantage, everyone would laugh at him behind his back for being a sucker. Socrates, if you want to prove to us that justice in itself is better for us than injustice, that it's not just about consequences, then you have to take reputation out of the equation. Imagine a truly good man. Someone who is always just, but unfortunately somehow got a reputation for the opposite. He'll be treated like a criminal. His fellow citizens will torture him, burn out his eyes, and crucify him. Now, imagine a true master of injustice. A man who gets away with everything and maintains a spotless reputation. He'll run the city. He'll fuck whoever he wants and be rich and help all his friends and crush his enemies. Once we take away the consequences of reputation, the life of injustice is better in every way. So, why choose justice? And that's not all. Think about what the people on the other side of the argument say. All of our lives, our parents, the poets, priests, tell us we should be good. They say being just is hard work and takes self-discipline, but in the long run, we'll be rewarded. They say that we should never cheat or take shortcuts because that's the easy way out and eventually we'll get caught and we'll be shamed and punished and hated by the whole city. And just to be sure they made their point, 
they throw in some stories about the afterlife. Homer and the other poets say that when the good die, they're led to a giant party in Hades to get drunk for the rest of time, and that bad men are tortured and buried in mud and anything else they can think of. Do you see my point? Even the people who teach us about morality only care about the consequences of being just, about the punishments and rewards you get out of it. Nobody cares about justice for itself, and they prove it every day. Everyone admires the rich and powerful, even if they know they're bad people. And if someone is poor and powerless, it doesn't matter how good he is. He'll be despised and ignored just the same. <coughs> Socrates. <coughs> What effect do you think all this has on young people? These people think they're teaching us to be just, but they're not. They're only teaching us that we should appear just. When you think about it, they're saying the same thing as Glaucon and Thrasymachus. That we should lie and cheat and do whatever we can to get ahead. And that as long as we can get away with it, we'll be happy. Now, some might say that these kinds of things are not so easy to get away with so we should play it safe and obey the rules. Well, I say that any great achievement takes great effort. So we'll form secret societies and hire sophists to help us persuade people, and we'll even use force if that's what it takes to get our way. And when it comes to the gods and the afterlife, we won't worry, because the same poets and priests that try to scare us with stories about Hades also tell us that the gods love sacrifices. That if we give enough to the gods, make enough burnt offerings, they'll forgive us and love us and curse our enemies. So we'll do injustice. We'll win in this life. And then we'll pay off the gods so we win in the afterlife too. Now tell me, if all this is true, what on earth could convince anyone who has any money or brains or family connections to respect justice? Why shouldn't we laugh when someone tells us to be good? Socrates, I don't want you to think that I personally believe all of this. But nobody, not even you, has ever defended justice except in terms of reputation and prestige and its rewards. Nobody has said what justice is itself, or what good it does when nobody's watching. So please, tell us, and leave reputation out of it. That is the challenge that Plato's brothers put to Socrates. Define justice and tell us what good it does for us. And to start, I would like to make a small point about conversational method. The brothers are defending the same bad boy skeptical position as Thrasymachus, but they also make a point of distancing themselves from it. Now, this doesn't mean that they've never thought about it before. Especially Glaucon, you get this ambiguity. He's interested in justice and in being good, but he also seems pretty excited about what he could do with an invisibility ring. But they're not sure. And more importantly, they're not there to try to prove that they're right and that Socrates is wrong. They're presenting the argument for consideration and hoping they might learn what there is to be said for all sides. They're trying to have a conversation, not a debate. And if this is the kind of conversation you want to have... Distancing yourself from an argument can be a really useful technique. Saying things like, it could be argued that, or, wouldn't some people say, or even, I'm asking for a friend. All these things can make it easier to explore ideas and play around with them, and it gives you enough space to change your mind. Whereas if you fully invest yourself in one position, and you say, this is how it is, like Thrasymachus did, you might feel embarrassed or humiliated if it turns out to be wrong or you have to change your mind a little bit. When you play devil's advocate, you can reduce the consequences of being wrong, and it can be freeing. Now, each of the boys has a distinct critique of justice. Glaucon's argument is about human nature. P says that deep down, everyone wants the same thing that the guy in the ring story wants. To fuck the queen, become king, and shoplift from the market. That's just how people are. So from Glaucon's point of view, as he's presenting it here, someone like Frodo Baggins is ridiculous. He has the ring of rings and has absolutely no fun with it. Only an epic nerd with no imagination could have 
all that power and be so miserable. Glaucon may be projecting his tyrant fantasies a little bit, but still his argument isn't crazy. There are a lot of people today that I think assume that if the forces of order slip for just a second, people will show their true colors and turn on each other like wild beasts. Now, Adamantus is a different kind of character. Whereas Glaucon is filled with these big passions and desires, Adamantus is a little more analytical or reflective. Whereas Glaucon argues that there's no basis in human nature for justice, Adamantus is saying there's no basis in Athenian nurture for justice. His argument is about ideology and public messaging. He's saying that the moral education that Athens gives to its young people is corrupting and actually encourages injustice. Explicitly, everyone tells young people that being just is good and admirable. But the stories they use to illustrate their point actually teach the opposite lesson. Adamantus backs this up with examples from Homer and Hesiod and other Greek poets. But we could do the same thing with stories from today. How many times have you read a story or seen a TV show or watched a movie where the moral of the story is supposed to be that crime doesn't pay? But as a matter of fact, the movie makes crime look pretty good. Like, think of how many movies you've seen where in the first half of the movie, the villain is having a great time. Exciting and rewarding work, money, babes everywhere, maybe even they have the respect and admiration of others. And the hero is toiling in obscurity, can't get a break, misunderstood, maybe even the hero's being held back because they're too honest. And then the plot happens, and the villain gets exposed and punished, and the hero finally gets the recognition that they deserve. The lesson that one might draw from such a story is not necessarily that crime is bad for you. It might be that getting caught is bad for you. In this kind of story, being bad is awesome until you get caught, and being good is miserable until you get caught. That is, until somebody important notices your hard work and you get the recognition you deserve. So why not have the best of both worlds? Why not get all the advantages of being bad, but then just pretend to be good? That's Adamantus and Glaucon's challenge to Socrates. And this may sound pretty selfish. It may sound like some spoiled young men saying, I can get away with whatever I want. Why should I be good? But I also think there's a more generous interpretation. Because most good people want some other reason for being good than rewards and punishments. For example, if you say, Wow, you just rescued a bunch of school children from a burning building. Why did you do something so heroic? A normal good person would say, I was just doing what had to be done. I saw that I could help and I couldn't let those kids die in there. This person is doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. No further justification is required. That's why they're a good person. But if I say, well... Rescuing kids from a burning building is classic headline material, so I was hoping I'd get some publicity for my podcast. In this case, I sound like a psychopath because I'm only doing the right thing because of the consequences to myself. Similarly, if the only reason you never break the rules is because you're afraid of being caught, that's not necessarily admirable. You may just be a coward. Adamantus and Glaucon are grown up, they're confident in their powers, and they're too proud to be pushed around by threats and bribes. They're saying, you can't scare us with kids' stories anymore. You can't threaten us. We want a better reason to be good. And the whole rest of the book is Socrates trying to give them one in a very indirect and long-winded kind of way. Getting back to the dialogue, Glaucon and Adamantus have just given their big speeches and Socrates is going to reluctantly accept their challenge and then immediately swerve off on a surprise detour that is going to shape the rest of the book. Glaucon, Adamantus, I am impressed. For two young men who I know are totally devoted to justice, 
you did an incredible job of defending the opposite. In fact, your arguments were so good, I don't even know if I can defend justice against that kind of attack. But on the other hand, I feel bad just standing here and not even speaking up for justice. So I guess maybe I should just try my best. Yeah, just do your best, Socrates. Come on, Socrates, you know you're going to tell us. All right, boys, you convince me. But I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy to see what justice in the individual soul is. So I propose a different approach. I say we construct a hypothetical city in speech. And then, as it's coming into being, we can see what justice and injustice are in the city. And when we understand that, we can come back and see if justice is the same thing in the individual. And that should be easier because cities are bigger than individuals. And things that are written on very large surfaces are easier to read than things that are written on tiny little objects. Does that make sense? Tons of sense. Go ahead, Socrates. Well, it seems to me that we start cities because we can't survive on our own. So we live together and we share with each other for everyone's advantage. Does that sound right? Yeah, of course it does. And we need food and shelter and clothes to survive, so we'll need a farmer and a builder and a weaver. And do you think we should add a shoemaker, too? Yeah, that would be good. Then your basic city is just four or five guys. And my next question to Adamantus is, should each person in the city do a little bit of everything, or should they all specialize in just one job? Well, I think they'll do better if they focus on one thing. In that case, we're going to need more than four men. Because the farmer's not going to make his own plow, and the weaver's not also going to be a shepherd, and no city has everything in its own territory, so we'll need merchants to trade for whatever we don't have. And then we'll need extra production, so we'll have a surplus to trade with. And if we go by sea, we'll need sailors and shipbuilders, and we'll need a market in the city and vendors to work in the marketplace... And we'll add some general laborers to do any extra jobs that are left over, and we'll pay them a wage. What do you think, Adamantus? Is our city complete? Maybe. Then let's take a closer look at it. This city has everyone we need to satisfy our needs. So tell me, Adamantus, where are justice and injustice? Where can we find them? Uh... I have no idea. Oh, wait, unless maybe um, it's in some sort of need that the people have of each other? You know, there may be something to that. Let's look at how they live together. I imagine that in the summer they'll be working almost naked and barefoot. But they'll have adequate clothes for the winter. And they'll live on barley cakes and loaves of bread. And they'll serve them on fresh leaves and lay down on beds of reeds covered in flowers and they'll feast and drink wine. And after that, they'll put garlands on their heads and sing to each other about the gods and have sex. But of course, they won't have any more children than they can afford, so there's no poverty and there's no war. You call that a feast, Socrates? Plain bread? You haven't even given them relishes. Good point, Glaucon. Let's let them have relishes. They'll have salt and olives and cheese, and for desserts, they'll have figs and chickpeas, just like out in the country. And they'll live peaceful and healthy lives and die in old age. And then they'll hand down the same kinds of lives to their children. It sounds like you're feeding a city of pigs, Socrates. Well, what kind of meals should we give them, Glaucon? Regular meals, like we eat today. Is eating cooked food off of tables too much to ask? Okay, Glaucon, I see that you want to describe the city that's inflamed with luxury. And that's a good idea, because maybe it'll help us find justice. I think that the city that we just described, that's the healthy city, that's the true city. But it's obviously not enough for some people. Some people need couches and tables and other furniture, and if they have that... They'll also want relishes and perfumes and incense and sex workers and cakes, all sorts of cakes. And for a luxurious city, basic houses and clothes will not be enough. We'll need painters and decorators and gold and ivory and embroidery. 
Now we're talking. So the city gets bigger, and it's going to be stuffed with musicians and poets and all their helpers, and teachers, and nurses, and beauticians, and barbers, and relish makers, and cooks, and swine herds. If we're going to eat meat, we'll need someone to raise the animals. Yes! And if we're going to live like this, we'll probably need more doctors. Yes, we will! And if we're going to have all of that, we're going to need more land. Because the little bit of land that the simple city needed for barley and beans isn't going to be enough for all this. We'll probably have to cut off a piece of our neighbor's land, and they'll probably try to do the same to us if they're living the same way. That's how it goes, Socrates. And the next step is... War. This section of the dialogue is one of the famous sudden left turns in the history of philosophy. Glaucon and Adamantus were only asking Socrates to prove to them that they should be just. And he says, Sure, let's start by designing an imaginary city from scratch. This city-soul analogy, the assumption that justice in the city and justice in the soul are the same, this is a structuring idea of the whole book. But it's weird, it's not intuitive, and it's not a very strong argument on the face of it. We have no good reason to believe that justice in a city is going to be the same as justice in an individual. Cities and individuals both have congestion, but even if I learn everything about traffic, I won't necessarily know anything about your sinuses. So this city-soul analogy, it wouldn't fly in a debate with a hostile opponent. Thrasymachus would have immediately rejected it. But the boys, they want to know what Socrates has to say, so they accept it, so they can see where he's going. And this is a really important moment in the conversation. You may remember that in the first episode of the series, I said, the Republic is like a magic carpet ride through Plato's mind. Well, when Socrates proposes the analogy between the soul and the city, that's him reaching out his hand and saying, do you trust me? You, uh, you don't want to go for a ride, do you? We could get out of the palace, see the world. As soon as the boys accept the proposal, they move from the individual perspective to the political perspective. And they introduce this principle of specialization. Each person can only have one job. When Socrates introduces this principle, he's pretty casual about it. It just makes a lot of sense that farmers shouldn't also have to be builders and shoemakers and weavers. It's no big deal. But one man, one job is going to be a key premise for the rest of the book. And it's going to eventually be used to support some much heavier conclusions. So, heads up. But for now, Socrates and the brothers are going to use the one man, one job principle to build two different hypothetical cities, each based on a different assumption about why we form political societies at all. Adamantus and Socrates, they're asking what society would look like if the underlying purpose of it was for humans to cooperate and help each other fulfill their basic needs. And the answer is, it would be a rustic utopia. Socrates describes this kind of golden age, where, materially speaking, people aren't rich, they mostly go barefoot and they have a very simple diet, but everyone has what they need. There's no war or poverty, and life is just feasting and fucking and singing karaoke with flowers in your hair. It seems pretty good. But we don't stay there for very long. And one reason for that is because it's kind of hard to see where justice comes into the picture. Following the rules, helping our friends, hurting our enemies, hard work, self-discipline. None of this stuff seems relevant in that world. And another reason we leave the utopia of human needs is that Glaucon is not happy there. To him, sitting bare ass on the floor, eating plain bread for dinner night after night, it isn't just boring, although it is boring. It's almost demeaning to human beings. Glaucon calls it a city of pigs. He wants more for his imaginary citizens. He wants them at least to be able to recline on couches, and have a civilized dinner like they do in Athens. And that simple request totally reshapes the entire city. 
Glaucon and Socrates, they keep the one-man-one-job premise, but they change the underlying purpose of political association. In the healthy city, it was basic needs, but in the city of luxury, the purpose is just to fulfill any desire that any citizen can imagine. And immediately, the city's expanding. Dinner tables lead to gold, ivory, meat-eating, performing arts. Appetites keep expanding, and they keep adding new people to feed them. So we have a contrast between two very different cities with different purposes. There's a city based on needs, and it's healthy and harmonious, and it may never have existed. And then there's the city based on unlimited desire. And here, there's no natural equilibrium point, like in the healthy city. Appetites just keep expanding, and they keep satisfying them until they need to invent doctors to treat their lifestyle diseases and come up with an army to invade their neighbors. And you might think that this is the point that Socrates was trying to make, that luxury and civilization are bad, and how everyone should consume only what they need and get back to what really matters. But that's not the point he's trying to make. Socrates isn't that basic, and the Republic isn't Avatar. The reason that Socrates introduced the whole logic of luxury is to explain why you need soldiers. That's what he wants to talk about. In the last section of the dialogue that we're going to do today, we're going to meet a very important new class of people. Enter the Guardians. Well, I guess if there's going to be war, our city needs to be bigger by an entire army. What about the citizens? Can't they defend themselves? Glaucon... Do you think that the art of shoemaking is more important than the art of war? <laughs> Definitely not. Well, we didn't let our shoemaker also be a farmer, did we? He had to specialize so he could do a good job. Do you think just anyone can pick up a spear and know what they're doing? No, of course not. And since this job is so important, don't you think that our guardians should be free to train and really become experts in war? They should definitely be experts, Socrates. Well, if we want the best soldiers, we need people who are naturally suited to that kind of life. We need young people who are like good hounds, who are fast and strong and have sharp senses. Exactly. And most important of all, they'll need spirit so they have the courage to face any danger. Very true, Socrates. But if the Guardians are strong and fast and have high spirits... What's to stop them from attacking each other or the other citizens? Nothing, I guess. Well, what's the point of having an army to protect the city if it's going to destroy the city itself? We need guardians who are fierce with their enemies but who are gentle with their own people. Well, where are we going to find people like that? Good question. But what about our example from earlier? Purebred dogs are friendly to people they know, and they're the opposite to strangers. True, true. There are lots of animals like that. And they're also like philosophers. Uh, what do you mean? Well, dogs are like lovers of knowledge because they define friend and enemy by knowledge and ignorance. They're friendly to people they know, and they're mean to people they don't know. Hmm, true. I never thought of that. And if all that's also true about humans, then we want guardians of the city to be... Lovers of wisdom who are spirited and swift and strong. The arrival of the Guardians is another big landmark in this book. You can basically forget about the farmers, weavers, embroiderers, and swineherds. They all go into one big category of people called producers that Socrates and the boys are mostly going to ignore for the rest of the book so they can talk about the Guardians. Why are they so interested in these guys? Why isn't being a soldier just a job like any other? There is one common interpretation that you may hear somewhere, which is that Plato or Socrates or both are proto-fascists and they want a military dictatorship, and that's why they're so obsessed with the Guardians. They want to build this class. I don't know what their private political opinions were. Still, I think this interpretation is misleading and superficial 
because these guys have lots of good reasons to talk about the Guardians, even if they're not fascists. First, just on a conversational level, focusing on the army is a smart rhetorical move by Socrates, given his audience. He's speaking to two young men who expect to take up prominent roles in Athens. As citizens, they've already served as soldiers and they're proud of it, and they are not the kind of people who are going to wind up working for a living. So they're going to identify much more with the Guardians than with any of the other occupations that we've mentioned. They're immediately more interested in these guys. These guys. But the most important reason to focus on the Guardians is a philosophical one. Only when the Guardians arrive can we even start to talk about justice and ethics. This is why they're not just another job that's extra violent. They represent a whole set of philosophical issues, and here's why. The city of needs, the city of luxury, they're not really cities. They're just economies. They're machines for fulfilling desires. That's why they haven't said anything about justice yet. In the healthy city, you work till you have enough to eat, then all you think about is making garlands and singing songs. And in the luxurious city, everyone is totally focused on fulfilling their spiraling appetites. The only question we have to ask is whether we should hire more dancers or more pastry chefs. And this is just the kind of question that economists today like to answer. How do we efficiently fulfill desires? But once you have a whole class of people whose expertise is in violence, this poses a big question, which is, how do you stop them from exploiting the people around them? All the stuff about following rules and self-discipline and helping your friends, this only comes into play when some people have the power to screw other people over and have the interest in doing it. The Guardians have this power, and so that's why ethics comes into play when they arrive on the scene. And this should remind you of the initial challenge posed by the brothers. Why should we be good when we have the power to be bad? In that part of dialogue that we just heard, Socrates is responding specifically to Glaucon's challenge. Remember, Glaucon's argument was all about human nature. He said everyone wants the same things, sex, power, money, and nobody would hesitate to screw everyone else over to get what they wanted if they weren't afraid of the consequences. That's what the guy in the ring story was like, and that's the same motivational engine behind the city of luxury. But now, Glaucon has this class of guardians. And that's a problem, because if they're also motivated only by their appetites, they are definitely going to exploit the other citizens. So if we want decent soldiers and protectors, we need humans that have a different nature. And that's where the philosophical dogs come in. On the surface, philosophical dogs may sound silly. But Socrates is introducing the possibility that there are natural motivations beyond appetite. Good dogs can conquer fear because they're spirited, and they're loyal to their friends, even when it's not in their own interest, because they're philosophical. This is all a bit of foreshadowing for a three-part model of the soul that Socrates is going to get into in Book 4. But at this point... The important thing is that Socrates is trying to open Glaucon to the possibility that humans are not only driven by appetite. Maybe we're more like dogs than pigs. But of course, nature isn't everything. Adamantus didn't say that humans have bad natures. He said the Athenians had bad nurtures. He thinks that their moral education is corrupting, that it encourages injustice rather than justice. So next episode, Socrates and Adamantus are going to take up the question of education. What do we have to teach little baby guardians so they can grow up to be the best they can be? This episode was brought to you by Patreon sponsor David Egan. Thank you, David. And as your theory fact for today... I want to talk about a little piece of the text that puzzled me for years and years until I started researching this podcast, and that is relish. 
when Glaucon is complaining about why the healthy city that he calls the city of pigs sucks, he asks for two things, a dinner set and relish. And the reason this passage stuck in my head since the first time I read the book is because it seemed hilarious to me that of all the things that were missing from the city of pigs, that Glaucon would choose relish to complain about. I knew he couldn't be talking about green hot dog sauce, but that is the only relish I know, so that's what stuck in my head. Anyway, I'm researching this podcast, and I find out that relish is an entire category of Greek food. You have the food that gives you your sustenance, like barley or bread, but then there was stuff for flavor. Cheese, olives, onions, and that's what relish means. Now, when Glaucon asks for relish, Socrates just gives it to those citizens and it doesn't disrupt the utopian equilibrium. They get their cheese, their olives, and they can stay in paradise. But when Glaucon wants the people to eat from a table, that disrupts the entire equilibrium. It's a tipping point into luxury and civilization and decadence. So why are tables so corrupting but relish isn't? Well, it turns out that in ancient Greece, reclining on couches to eat from tables was symbolic of civilization. It was how classy Greeks did things in Athens, as against foreigners or rednecks. And that's why a table isn't just a table. It represents all the finer things in life, the things that tell us that we're better than other people, and that prevent us from living in harmony with nature or with each other. 